Britain takes steps to regulate content that appears on social media. It says it wants to protect users from what it considers harmful material. But is regulation the answer and can it be done without violating personal freedoms? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, it's a long-running debate. How should we regulate the internet and social media? While sites, including Facebook and Twitter, allow us to share information, they've also become places for illegal and harmful content to thrive. The UK now wants those firms to be more responsible. The government will appoint its broadcast regulator, Ofcom, as an online watchdog, with powers to force companies to take down certain material. We have a lot to discuss with our guests, but first, this report from Paul Brennan in London. My name's Megan Hinton. Pressurised to send a nude photograph of herself to a boy at school, within a day, Megan Hinton's private image had been circulated across the internet. It can take days, even weeks, to be removed off of a social media site, so that can have a devastating impact. You know, once something's up there, not only is it out on the wide web, people can save it to their phone, so even when the social media company removes it, it's still in people's possessions. Social media is largely self-regulating. Platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and TikTok largely set their own rules and standards, sometimes relying on the platform users themselves to flag up anything inappropriate. The UK government has been consulting since last summer on how to introduce a new online harms law to put the responsibility on social media companies to remove harmful content. Child protection charities certainly support that. Ultimately, regulation is required. That's what we would argue. The big tech giants need to be held to account. The regulator needs teeth. So they not only need to monitor what's going on and talk about it publicly, but, but also hold to account these multi-billion pound platforms. None of the social media giants were available for interview, preferring to issue written statements. The boss of YouTube UK said to help keep our community safe, we haven't waited for regulation, we've created new technology, hired expert reviewers, worked with external specialists and reviewed our policies to ensure they're fit for the evolving challenges we face online. Facebook's head of public policy said we have clear rules about what is and isn't allowed on our platforms and are investing billions in safety. We look forward to carrying on the discussion with the government, parliament and the rest of industry as this process continues. The regulation of web content is a complex area which touches on issues such as freedom of speech, censorship and jurisdiction. And there's also the question of defining what is subjectively offensive and what actually qualifies as harmful. But it seems the UK government is prepared to try to tackle the issue. And the full details of the new law will be published later in the spring. Paul Brennan, Al Jazeera, London. Well, let's now bring in our guests. In Cambridge, we have David Erdos. He's Deputy Director at the Centre for Intellectual Property and Information Law at Cambridge University. In Brussels, we have Eliska Perkova. She's the Europe Policy Analyst at Access Now. That's a digital rights advocacy group. And in Oxford, we have Mira Selva. She's the Director of the Journalism Fellowship Programme at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University. Welcome to you all. Um, David, I want to start with you. Because social media is fundamentally about individuals uploading their own content to these platforms, right? So where does the responsibility lie then? With the individuals or with the platforms? And if we then hand that responsibility to the platforms, does that then mean that individuals then don't have the accountability for what they post? Well, I, I, don't, th I don't think anyone's saying that ultimately if an original publisher, even an individual, uploads information online that they aren't responsible for the legality of that. But we have to be aware that unlike, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, and particularly in the offline world, when it was largely professional actors who had a name and address and were locatable, today we have hundreds of millions of amateur individuals uploading often anonymously in en masse in a way which is, frankly, as your report showed, impossible for uh, authorities to usually take action on. Of course, they will take action in the most serious of cases. Hmm. And at the same time, we've moved from 
intermediaries being literally like a, a, a print factory mm. or the neutral online equivalent to curating platforms, platforms which monetize, organize, arrange sure. and develop a content alongside their users and need to take a degree of responsibility for the effects of their service as a whole. So I don't think it's about saying that they are the original publisher. That would be absurd. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's about saying that individuals have no responsibility, but it's about creating the appropriate responsibility for these uh, new platforms. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to the content then, Mira, let me pose a question that Paul Brennan asked in his report. What is the difference between offensive and harmful content and who gets to decide that? Well, this is the ultimate question, and we need to look at who the audience are. So when the audience are children, then yes, there are certainly certain types of content that you would not want them to see, pornography and so on, violent images. Most platform companies have an age limit. You need to be above a certain age in order to have an account with Facebook, for example, but this is often something that's sidestepped and the com platform companies will say this is something that parents have to take charge of them and it's not something they can police. The second point is that there are existing laws already against much of this content. It is illegal to uh, distribute child pornography in any format mm. or to spread hate speech or to incite violence. So these laws already exist in the public space and there is a st very strong argument for saying they should be implemented in the private space. But the idea of making private companies somehow responsible for deciding what should and should be said is, is a worrying trend, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, also because it's social media, I guess speed is also a huge issue because of so much being uploaded and how quickly it spreads. So if the platforms then are going to be held responsible, might they then err on the side of caution because there, there wouldn't be necessarily a chance for an appeal here. So might they then take down more content than is perhaps... Um, necessary. And let me put that question to Eliska. What do you think? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, ultimately extremely important issue here. Uh, first of all, uh, we see prevailing trend uh, not only in the UK but also uh, in other European and non-European legislations to slowly shift more and more responsibility on online platforms and usually to adopt the approach uh, to illegal or potentially harmful content focusing on swift removals and deletions of such a type of content. Uh, this of course imposes a various human rights concerns and especially for freedom of expression on online users, mm -hmm. especially if the platforms are required to remove this content in very short time frames mm -hmm. that then uh, won't create any possibility for content providers or online users in general to challenge decisions of the platforms. And of course, it also creates a risk for over removal of legitimate speech from online platforms. Sure, Eliska. Well, there's also been a, a big focus in terms of this legislation on online bullying as well. And when we talk about personal freedoms, privacy is obviously a huge one. So mm -hmm. if we are talking about online bullying and a lot of this stuff, I imagine, goes on in like private messages as well. Does that mean that we're, we're needing to broaden the oversights of these platforms? And, and does that create issues around privacy? Um, it definitely does, but I think there is uh, another quite important issue uh, which is also addressed by the UK white paper on online harms and that's that distinction between uh, harmful but le legal content and content that actually violates the existing national laws. And when we speak about cyberbullying or another extremely harmful fe societal phenomena online, it doesn't necessarily always mean that they actually meet the the threshold of illegality from the national law perspective. Um, and this is extremely important and it's also like uh, the part of the concerns that many civil society groups raised mm. last summer when the paper was actually published. And we are very happy to see that actually the government has been very receptive and tries to actually accommodate our concerns. Uh, when it comes to legal but harmful, uh, it's extremely important that these definitions are not too overboard and too vague. And uh, these definitions also need to be then clearly uh, stated. And it needs to be important that even if the terms of service of these platforms is being enforced when actually identifying and that depicting such a content, mm -hmm. um, these terms of service are applied transparently and the definitions are not actually harmful to freedom of expression online. Sure. Um, then, 
of course, uh, the issue of privacy is are also extremely important, and it's important that uh, in European framework, for, for instance, the GDPR is being uh, not only formally complied with, but also uh, satisfactory and always in favor of users' right to privacy. Sure. So there are a lot of laws that already exist. But here I, I do want to talk about capacity in terms of regulation and the implementation of these laws, right? So I see YouTube at the moment employs about 10,000 people in monitoring, removing content, policy development. Facebook and Instagram have more than 35,000 people working on safety and security. Ofcom at the moment employs about 1,000 people, and they're also monitoring the media. So how is this going to work, David? Absolutely. Well, I mean, just to come back on a few of those points, I mean, no one is suggesting that they're not many freedom of expression issues. But I think we have been naive to uh, underestimate that YouTube and, and other platforms like Google depend on user-generated content. That's mm. how they make their profits. And they even make their profits in relation to illegal content. I mean, in relation to copyright, that is maybe the clearest. And the copyright directive from the EU is, is trying to address that. But they do depend on being free and open, albeit curated also, platforms. Mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't be too blinkered in our analysis just in thinking about over-removal. There's been a lot of under-removal of sure. clearly illegal content and under-enforcement of other forms of illegality like abuse and harassment online. And democratic governments are responding to the concerns of their citizens in trying to tackle that as a human rights issue mm -hmm. in terms of the impact that has. Now, in terms of the resources, yes, I think you're right that you know, we have lots of laws, particularly here in Europe and even with Brexit here in the UK, but we haven't been very effective, particularly online, in enforcing that. You know, the Information Commissioner, which has roles in relation to the right to be forgotten and search engines, which are part of data protection, but also part of online harms regulation, has 700 people. Uh, and you've said that Ofcom has 1,000 people. But uh, Facebook and Google have um, a turnovers which make it very difficult to um, mm. enforce the law when there is motivated opposition to it. So we need we need to up our game in terms of public regulation. And I think this, this is a start. It will be complex, but it's important. Well, you're talking about companies there with huge turnovers. Mira, I want to turn to you because a lot of this then becomes about self self-regulation for a lot of these platforms. And there are a lot of smaller platforms, startups and, and other companies will be affected by this law. So how are they going to cope? Are they going to have the resources to be able to do this kind of self-regulation, Mira? Well, it depends what these companies are doing. And if I talk about journalism in particular, because this is an area where uh, there are very legitimate concerns, which is how will these platform companies judge the validity of news stories, some of which would do contain disturbing content. There can be stories of violent sexual attack or kind of very violent imagery if you're reporting on a conflict zone. And who makes the judgment call over whether these stories are going to be able to be viewed on social media or not? And when you look at the media industry, it is more and more people get their news via Facebook. Mm. Twitter, Google search than from news organizations' own homepages. So this is a very important source of news for many people. And I know that several editors are worried that these kind of regulations will make it harder for them to push out the news stories they want to push out. So there are real the platforms freedom of expression yeah, and, and well issues around that there then, Mira. Absolutely. And the other thing you've got to be very careful of is how this plays out globally. So when we had worries over misinformation and fake news, mm. the the governments that were the quickest to implement fake news laws were ones that had an authoritarian bent who weren't the best defenders of free speech. And the laws once implemented, like in Singapore, were used immediately to attack critical media and opposition parties. So mm. a law like this that is passed in Britain can play out globally. And these are tech companies themselves are global, so we need to be aware of how things get seen around the world. Absolutely. Well, I see that Facebook has welcomed this, and it's saying that this is a step towards a consolidated approach to protection on the internet. I do want to zoom out on your point, Mira, um, and look at what some of the other countries in the world are doing here. 
So, well, the UK is not the only country that's wrestling with this issue. Germany already has a special law that says social media companies must remove banned content within 24 hours or face fines of up to $54 million. Australia also passed similar legislation last year. Tech executives can face prison for failing to remove extremely violent content. France and New Zealand created the Christchurch call last year. That was in response to a shooting at two mosques that was then live streamed on Facebook. It's a plan to limit the spread of violent content. And China has what many call the Great Firewall, where several websites are banned outright and content is obviously strictly regulated. So, Aliska, let me ask you then, where's the middle ground then between protection and censorship? Hmm. Um, I think there was a very important issue uh, raised here. Uh, I think that many of these laws that you already mentioned, whether that's Net Deger or also so-called German anti-hate speech law, also as well as other legislative efforts, they're strictly focusing on the content removal and the way how the content is actually being regulated. Mm. But we also should focus on how the content is actually being distributed across the platform. Of course, the issues such as online hate speech or also disinformation are deeply rooted societal phenomena and to expect that the simple removal in an extremely short time frames will be actually the long-term solution would be of course naive and narrow-minded and not particularly friendly towards human rights of online users. Mm. So uh, I think both are very important. On one hand, the regulation that will actually set minimum human rights standards that will establish the environment of the leg legal certainty, meaning that the companies are, are well, as well as users clearly understand their duties and responsibilities. And at the same time, the proper accountability and transparency mechanisms are extremely important. Uh, when it comes to transparency, uh, there are already within the laws that you also mentioned, whether that's Netzdege or the French so-called Avia law, uh, both of them actually contain the transparency requirements uh, for online platforms. However, these transparency requirements need to also focus not only on the quantity of the removed content, but they need to inform uh, the policy and give the overall picture about what is actually happening on these platforms. Mm. Um, only the research and evidence-based policy making uh, can actually then create satisfactory responses to societal phenomena online. Uh, so I would say uh, regulation that sets minimum standards, the minimum duty of care for online platforms and everything that is human and all these provisions have to be human mm. rights and user centric in that regard. And then, of course, the whole entire issue of automation and how automated measures are being often deployed by platforms for content regulation. Mm. That's another important topic that needs to be discussed and certain standards need to be actually set in the regulation. Well, I wanted to ask about that because, you know, we were talking about the speed of things going viral, the, the speed of things um, spreading, is there then the space or, or should there then be the space for AI, artificial intelligence, to step in here to take things down in real time? David, let me ask you about that and, and are there concerns about yes. AI here? Well, I, I think this brings up the whole interface with, with general data protection, which has been mentioned. A general data protection both requires privacy to be protected, search engines have felt the heat on that with the right to be forgotten, but it also regulates back-end processing. And back-end processing can be about monetizing the content, and that can, can, can fuel illegality. Mm. But it's also about how far we can go in monitoring and managing content in order to ensure legality through AI. But I think AI is, is coming. I think it is part of the solution in terms of manifest illegality. And the government's quite right to mm -hmm. focus on what is illegal rather than getting into a complex debate uh, about harmful content, at least not involving children, because that really would be uh, a dangerous censorship. Uh, but I think AI needs to be accountable and transparent. Mm -hmm. And it's the role of, in fact, the Information Commissioner and data protection authorities to ensure that AI operates within a, a framework uh, which is human-centric. But because of the scale of the harms online, and you know the need for rapid uh, action, I think that AI has to play a role. Well, we're talking here about building a broader framework, right? So, Mira, I, I want to ask you about the different approaches. We've, we've talked about different approaches, different laws from different countries, and it does seem rather ad hoc. So is there the space then, or should there be the space for a, a universal declaration of sorts, given that the internet is a shared global resource? Um, 
should there be a consolidated global approach where all the countries come together and, and make a plan? Well, that would be nice in theory, and I know that UNESCO has suggested the idea of kind of digital rights, a universal set of digital rights that every citizen of the world has a right to uh, claim. This is obviously problematic in that different countries have very different approaches to political discourse, to free Indeed. speech, to what is, and cultural values, what's acceptable in terms of sexuality and religion. And so it you don't want a kind of consensus that erodes significant rights in certain countries to bring it to a kind of level that everyone accepts. That said, I think there's certainly an argument for a global set of standards, but this is something that needs to also come from the tech companies themselves that need to truly invest globally in making sure they understand all the cultures of all the countries that they operate in. And we talk about AI, and AI itself is not a neutral force. AI is written by human beings who bring in their own biases to coding. And we see this certainly the way some AI codes um, in terms of gender and race, you know, facial recognition. It's not at all a neutral space. So we need to be very aware that any solution has to work for everybody in all parts of the world and for men and for women. And this is something that can only really be done on a human scale. It has to be done by humans first. Mm -hmm. And we have to get that right first before we try to automate it. Absolutely. Well, speaking of getting it right, one of the things that this law does talk about is punishment. And I want to ask David briefly about this. I see in Germany we were saying companies could be fined up to 50 million euros. In Australia, aside from being jailed, a company could be fined up to 10% of its global turnover. So what kinds of fines are we looking at here in the UK? Well, at the moment, the British government has published its interim response to the consultation, and it's parked that in the too hard basket for now because it's uh, clearly one of the most controversial issues. But we do have models out there. So, you know, search engines, again, under the right to be forgotten, already face under data protection legislation the prospect of 20 million euro fines for infringement or 4% of annual global turnover. But mm -hmm. yes, that's eye-watering, but uh, we, we, you know, that is a model which is already across the entirety of the EU. Uh, it, that there are also issues about how, which establishment, where, where, you know, companies are global on the internet, whereas mm -hmm. le regulation is local. And we need to think very carefully about how companies with a partial footprint in the relevant jurisdiction here in Britain can be uh, pursued in a proportionate way. But I think we are probably looking at, at, at some kind mm -hmm. of signing system if the duty of care is breached systemically. We're not talking about monitoring every single potential infraction, mm. but just companies discharging a duty of care to their, their, their communities and society at large. Sure. Eliska, I'm going to give you a last very brief say here, because I do want to ask you, the law does say, well, the British government has said that it will protect online users' rights by safeguarding free speech, promoting new technology and ensuring businesses are not unduly impacted. Do you have the confidence that they're going to be able to do that, given what they've already said? Uh, well, uh, Access Now definitely welcomes that actually the government is receptive to the numerous concerns that were raised by the civil societies. It remains to be seen. I also don't want to go into the details at this stage and, uh, you know, create some speculation around how the law will eventually play out. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is extremely important that there will be clear distinction between illegal content and uh, legal but harmful. Mm. Uh, it is uh, extremely important that the transparency requirements will be clearly stated in whatever regulation is uh, coming our way. Um, and also, um, we will keep following uh, the initiative as we do in uh, numerous other countries. And uh, we are definitely um, uh, trusting the regulators in getting this right, but it's also important for regulators to realize that can, any kind of these legislative proposals, not only in the UK, but also in the European Union, have the influence beyond the European Union and beyond mm. their national borders. Uh, other regulators in maybe in the countries which are less democratic and more authoritarian are getting mm. inspired. And we see now more and more of these regulatory efforts popping up in various parts of the world. Hence, it's extremely important that the legislature get this right and they will put the human rights of online users at first place. And it's a very, very fine line to walk there. Well, we'll continue following this very closely. But for now, thank you to all of our guests. That's David Erdos, Eliska Prakova and Mira Selva.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now. <laughs>